inviting these folks to experts who have done it all. They could give us the little snippets of how they did it. And each one is a different slant. Uh, we have Professor Nagi, you know, from how it started out in a, a rural setting and how it became a world-class center, which is such a huge building. And we have Anthony, you know, uh, how he's moved on towards the realm of therapeutics. And of course, we have Professor Devere, you know, he's running his uh, wonderful workshop every year, which has been around for so many years. Of course, together with Hong Kong too, they've also done that. And of course, lastly, uh, I mean, I'm my own center, you know, Chris, he was actually able to set up a, a very modern endoscopy unit. So I hope that each one of uh, these talks will be able to give insights to all the young and upcoming endoscopists as they build up the endoscopy units. Uh, so without much further ado, I'd like to uh, ask uh, Dr. Reddy to take the first session. Dr. Reddy, over to you. Thank you, Damon, and thank you, Mohamed, for this uh, very innovative session. Uh, I think... Uh, this is a very unique session in a conference where you have different people sharing different uh, areas. So I'll just very briefly go through what happened, the story of AAG. I know the story of AAG is about 30 years old, so to condense into 15 minutes is not so easy, so I'll have to go a little uh, fast. We, of course, uh, Indian map is here, everybody knows, and we are in Hyderabad, which is the southern part of India. It's a, it's a, it's a relatively smaller city in India, although we have a population of about 15 million, by Indian standards, not too bad. Uh, this is where we are in Hyderabad. So if you, Hyderabad is historically an old city, 400 years old. We have many monuments and some of you have visited Hyderabad. It's getting a little modernized now, but like every part of uh, uh, India, Hyderabad also is, has a lot of paradoxes. Uh, for example, if you want to order a pizza, you can get it in 30 minutes. But if you want to go, if you order for an ambulance, you'll get it uh, maybe next day. This is the problem. Also, there are more mobile phones than toilets in India right now. And this is uh, actually absolutely true. So there are a lot of paradoxes that we are dealing with. And so also in healthcare, we have healthcare, which is federal government sponsored. We have healthcare, which comes from private corporate hospitals, which are extremely expensive, mainly functional patients. All the organic patients who go to Federal hospitals don't have enough facilities. So this is the problem. And the concept of Asian Institute of Gastroenterology started from this, where we thought we should build an institute devoted specifically to gastroenterology based on clinical services, research training, and community services. Of course, there are many challenges at that time in 2005 and four when we started this institute. Uh, awareness of gastroenterology was very less. Our economy was not very good. We didn't have trained staff in gastroenterology to carry out this. But over a period of years, we build up, a, build up an institute which is predominantly therapeutic endoscopy based, but I had hepatology, pancreatology, GS surgery as a backup, and of course, um, uh, Institute for Research. What we did was a one third formula where uh, one third of the patients were paying, one third were subsidized, and one third were free. So we could cater to all categories of uh, patients that we had. Uh, of course, the staff in the institute had to devote one third of the time to service for the patients, one third to teaching and one third to research. So this was the one third formula we evolved so that we could cater to different groups of patients. Uh, we built up a team over that time of about 25 medical gastroenterologists, say surgical gastroenterologists and all the paramedical de departments which are based on gastroenterology itself. So soon we became very busy. This was about um, almost now 15 years back. You can see our outpatients became very crowded. It was the hospital, we never realized that a gastroenterology institute alone, standalone, would become so crowded, but it became. And we're typically doing, uh, at that point of time, about 450 to 500 endoscopic procedures a day, an outpatient of equal number, an inpatient of about purely gastroenterology patients of about 300 per day. Uh, we soon got several ratings, uh, but of course, one of the reasons why AAG at that point was very successful was because gastroenterology as an allied speciality was untapped and people used to go to general hospitals where gastroenterology was delegated to a small area. It was also a one-stop destination for all GI related issues. We had high patient volumes. All the staff were fully salaried. They're not, they couldn't practice. And of course we kept our care affordable at a very cheap rate and one third of our patients were given free care. So because of all this, we started to, to become very successful. And of course, our goal and our philosophy was patient first. Uh, we had uh, several subdivisions in gastroenterology, as you can see here, not only therapeutic endoscopy, but uh, our uh, basic science also became very important. And we started then, of course, encouraging uh, publications and so on for all the consultants. We had a lot of trainees, many 
BNB fellows uh, per year, which is super specialty training in gastroenterology, and several international trainees who are now occupying important positions. And this is the area where we actually enjoy training our international trainees because we felt they got in a culture which was different from what we had. And of course, the mix was very good. We started, of course, a lot of congresses, but the first World Congress that came in a few years back, many of you attended that was, of course, uh, one of our highlights. And we had several focus areas, for example, therapeutic uh, pancreatic biliary endoscopy, third space endoscopy was one of the areas where we focused. What we did was to have many experts in these areas who are pioneers to come. In fact, when Professor Inui started POEM first, he came and spent a week with us, actually. And we, of course, started uh, now uh, a lot of POEM procedures, or third space procedures are going. And similarly, you can see Jack Davey here, Professor Michelle Framer, who inspired our journey into pancreatic endotherapy with extracorporeal shockwell. It's Gripsy. When I visited the department, I saw what was happening. We brought it into our department. And then, of course, now ESWL and the consequences of treating chronic pancreatitis has become extremely common in our department because the volume, the loads of the patients are very, very high. Uh, we now have a report of over 5,000 patients who have been treated with extracorporeal shockwave and endoscopic therapy. So we did focus on areas which are very important to us, but also on cutting edge research. And of course, uh, Chris and Damien would know this, that our group from Singapore came in and uh, we were actually involved in the first human uh, cases of robotic endoscopy that uh, came inside. Uh, one of the important things we learned when we built the institution was that it's very important to have international collaborations. And we did this with many of the other uh, centers which uh, all over the world. And this international collaborations helped us not only in getting a better perspective, but of course, getting involved in multi-centric trials uh, like this, which uh, of course resulted in uh, not only improving science in this area, but good publications that we had. Uh, we did also combine with uh, the Indian Institute of Science and Technology to a basically engineering institutions to create uh, especially innovation, device innovation areas. Again, something that I learned from Jack Davey and his Belgium group. And you can see here the endoscopic simulator that we made out of this, uh, which is extremely cheap and which is now widespread use. We also concentrated on instead of being a purely private sector on translational research. And you can see here our translational research center again had several collaborations and had a lot of funding from the government of India and from other uh, uh, agencies. We had a lot of philanthropic donations also. And of course, uh, we have several basic um, uh, discoveries in this area, gene discoveries in chronic ca ca pancreatitis. We also saw it that these went into public domain so that people were able to appreciate it, went into news. And of course, now it's digital media which dominates. One of the things we did uh, very successfully was biobanking at AAG. All tissues that come out in AAG are biobanked at minus 80 or minus 190 so that our basic scientists can use them for future research work. And biobank, uh, personalized medicine, personalized surgery is becoming very important. Now all our patients coming to AAG, for example, have a precision medicine where they get a genomic pathway or pharmacogenomic pathway of what medicine they're taking so they can take the right doses. And these are some of the things we concentrated as a high-tech institute. But what we also found was that uh, there is a need to look after our patients who are most of them, 70% of our population live in villages, don't have access to good medical care. Of course, they are very unique uh, population group. They're getting very better in terms of actually looking to see how they can actually manipulate the computers and all. But unfortunately, healthcare is not a, a good state in our country. And of course, I think Egypt also shares some of these things with us. And we have a, a problem of uh, hygienic healthcare and Lancet had a whole issue on this a few years back. So we started this AAG Rural Healthcare Initiative where we started looking at epidemiology of diseases and different care and whether we can take healthcare to the, the patients uh, themselves. So we started this um, doorstep healthcare concept where our states, different regions in our, country, in our, city, in our area were mapped out and using this uh, satellite connection, we could connect to all of them. We had these rural vans which went into the villages, uh, which did, um, in this van itself, we could do apogee endoscopy, colonoscopy, ultrasound. We had a lab there, pharmacy. We collected a lot of epidemiological data and a team was specifically devoted to uh, these efforts. And you can see these uh, rural vans, which are actually in the villages where endoscopy is being done by one of our residents here, transmitted with this van into the telemedicine department at AAG. And, uh, we could monitor a lot of what was happening there. And this uh, 
would typically be a base camp on the first day, followed by consultation and the procedure there. So that way we covered a population of more than 10 million now using this. Uh, where You can see typically in a village, even under a tree, we'd, we'd set up this consultation camps. It was a good experience because we had access to certain areas which even the government of India didn't have access. This was actually areas where we had to take our whole on a raft, you know, the healthcare van and all on raft. And we went into these villages. You can see very grateful patients there who had never seen doctors for many years. And especially because we are catering to women and children who were not traditionally coming to our hospital. So this was a good experience. We learned a lot also in terms of, for example, the incidence of H. pylori is extremely high in these places, but gastric cancer is low. Whereas H. pylori incidence in the city of Hyderabad is significantly high. So there are differences. There are also areas like we saw these scenes. You can see this was a patient intestinal obstruction. And when we did an endoscopy, you can see the worms that are there in the stomach. So there were different types of pathologies that we're seeing. We also had to look, for example, is there a need for screening colonoscopy in our country? And we looked at this population screening. You can see a population of villages of 15,000, 150 individuals, and just two polyps, one small adenomatous, one hyperplastic. Conclusions from this was that maybe majority of this population has different environment, diet, genetics, and screening colonoscopies are not needed and waste of time. Uh, so this mobile endoscopy unit uh, going into the villages had several unique features about them. We had a lot of corporate donors who gave us money to run this industry, which gave us money to run this. We started biobanking of all the material we got from there. But more important is the tremendous satisfaction that uh, our staff got from doing this. So we still run this very effectively. We have now adapted many of these villages where we run these programs. We have discovered several specific areas of disease prevalence. There are some areas where you have very high incidence of IBD, for example, surprisingly, in our country. So this is, has been very useful. So when we started doing this, of course, we had, had recognition from the government. We said, okay, we'll, they allotted us a large piece of land to build a new modern hospital. But building uh, institutions in our, in our country is not so easy. There are uh, several problems, including the problems of permissions. From, for example, typically, we require 65 permissions from the government, 55 licenses, the problem of finances, how to get finances, donations, banks, and so on. And therefore, all these were problems. But fortunately, you can see this is a large piece of land in our, in our new hospital, which the government gave us, about 10 acres, on which we could build a large hospital, which is predominantly gastroenterology, which now has nearly 1,000 beds. Uh, and a research block. Um, of course, we now have additional specialities to support us uh, because I think when you're doing advanced work like transplants, uh, liver transplants and so on, you require additional support from cardiology, neurology. And as this um, hospital was growing, you can see how it's uh, coming up. You can see clearly these two blocks that we had. Uh, one was the research block, the smaller one, and other was the main block. We could, of course, uh, have much better amenities in this compared to what we had in the old hospital. Our endoscopy unit, especially, is something that we are very, very proud of. We have about 30 uh, individual uh, endoscopy suites with uh, everything under the studio where we can transmit. So this has been something we took some years to build and, of course, now being recognized. Uh, one of the reasons, of course, there are many for what happened in a country like India, it's not so easy to build institutions. There are several reasons which have been um, responsible for our success. One, of course, luck as it's needed all the way. All our staff work very hard. We've had a lot of goodwill from society. And I think predominantly it's the teamwork that has been very important. We have, we have now, actually now we have about uh, 70 gastroenterologists and gastric gastroenterologists. Uh, surgeons, about 30 basic scientists, and a variety of other uh, specialities uh, who are all working together as a team. And this teamwork was the reason for our success. And this is an important message that I'd like to convey that only when something is done as a team do we ultimately succeed. Of course, we have a long way to go still. I know building institutions in developing and emerging countries, again, like in Egypt, is going to be difficult. We have a long way. We learned a lot of lessons. And I think one of the important lessons we learned is that we have to have the goodwill of the society, a good team, a lot of hard work, luck to succeed. Thank you very much for your uh, opportunity that I'm given. Wow. Thank you very much, Professor Reddy. That's such an excellent uh, talk. I, I think it's uh, very inspiring to hear about, you know, in a country where uh, resources are limited, how you managed to build up uh, from scratch a world-class endoscopy unit. 
Um, so I think one thing that always goes uh, on the minds of people, you know, is always about finances. I mean, you, I think you briefly mentioned it. Uh, so I think it started out as a trust hospital first, correct? And yeah. I, I think get philanthropy support. But again, moving on to the next phase, I mean, I think you became uh, successful and I think success begets success. And I guess you became uh, like a private uh, wing coming up and that also helped to fund all your efforts. Is that correct? Yes, yes. So it was, uh, the funding was... Uh... Three, three ways. One was, of course, uh, all the funding for research came from the Government of India funds because like NIH, we have uh, separate institutions called ICMR, which funds. So the funding for the private uh, section came from a lot of donors. And that is very important uh, in the sense that you have to build up a goodwill among the society. Otherwise, donors are very difficult to get in, especially in emerging economy. So funding for that came a lot from donors. We had some banks which are very sympathetic and gave us funds at a very low rates which you could we pay over a long period of time. So these are the three sources of funding that we had. And I think uh, it's very important to manage them very adequately. Again, uh, in a fed, which is not federal government set up to get these funds, uh, not so easy. So it's a little effort, but I think it's basically the goodwill in the society that you create that actually gets us the funds. Fantastic. And uh, one last question. Uh, people always talk about uh, academic endoscopic units being affiliated universities or coming out of the university hospital system. How were you be, uh, able to be so successful academically without, you know, starting off as a university hospital in the first place? No, I think uh, there's no need uh, to have a university attachment because what you're doing in endoscopy or your team is doing, uh, it's predominantly your team's work or what effort you do. The university just gives it a label, that's all. And this label, I think, is not relevant, especially uh, when you're doing things in your... For example, in our unit now, every patient who comes in goes into some trial. So we have so many randomized control trials going on that every patient goes into trial. The whole, um, the whole um, mindset of the unit is, okay, this is an interesting case. How, how do we put it into a trial? Or how do we publish this case? The patient is looked after well, the care of the patient. In fact, I found that paradoxically, when we put the patients into trials, they get better care. Patient is looked after well. Uh, but uh, constantly, I think the whole mindset of the unit should be, well, I mean, all the units that we have here, you know, Anthony is here, Chris is here, Jack, of course. I think everything, in all the units, same thing happens, that you're now constantly looking at patients to see how you can advance science by doing things. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay, are there any questions from any of the panelists or the audience? Uh, we have a bit of time, because I think the next speaker is unavailable. Do, do we have any questions? Pardon? Okay. Uh, we can't go on to the next speaker. This is, this is from Egypt, or I don't know, I can't hear. Yeah, this is from Egypt. Okay. Uh, do you have a question from Egypt? No, 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 no questions. No questions? Okay, Ken. All right, so thank you very much, Professor Reddy. Uh, I mean, we'll be happy to take questions also. I mean, uh, you have yeah. some more questions along the way. Uh, originally, the next speaker is supposed to be Professor Evan Fogel from the US, but I think due to some technical issues, he can't make it. Uh, so, is Anthony, if you're okay, is it all right? Uh, you go ahead first. Uh, I mean, you can start your talk. And uh, basically, I, I invited Anthony because, you know, I think that uh, he's a uh, his uh, unit is one of the breaking, groundbreaking units in which they are doing so much uh, therapeutic endoscopy, you know, breaking the barriers in terms of uh, therapeutic uh, EUS, uh, in terms of poems or uh, uh, dissection work. Uh, and he is a surgeon. So, I mean, as surgeons, they also have the ability to cross over easily. So I thought it would be a very good uh, uh, for, for us to hear from his perspective, you know, how a, a unit that we start off as a traditionally as a more diagnostic crosses over to the interventional, uh, more therapeutic world, and uh, what kind of support is needed, you know, because many of us are, are you know, gastroenterologists rather than surgeons, so, you know, if you do have complications and, you know, what, how we deal with it in the unit, okay? So, uh, pass it over to you, Anthony. Thank you, Damien. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak in the Egyptian conference. Um, I'm very honored and privileged to be here. Um, so, um, yes, Damien has uh, given me this, this task to talk about uh, breaking barriers in the therapeutic uh, endoscopy unit. So, uh, with our unit, actually, it's just not, it's not only me, but uh, many, many uh, of our colleagues and my predecessors actually helped with uh, developing the unit. So, 
Um, as Nagi has said just now, uh, working as a team is very important because uh, together everyone achieves more. So um, only by working as a team, when we all have our own different goals and visions that um, we can develop a unit into a uh, much better unit. So um, as uh, Damien has given me this task, um, I'm talking about breaking barriers. So it is really about this idea on innovation. How can we innovate? As a doctor, we are not um, generally um, accustomed to innovate because uh, during our brought up uh, our education, we are actually taught by our teachers or predecessors to follow a specific set of rules when they see a clinical problem, they should deal with it in a certain clinical way. So actually there's not much area for us to be creative, uh, particularly when we're dealing with our human lives. Uh, there are conditions that, um, that we know a lot about, but there are also conditions and management actually we don't know. So when we step into this unknown zone, our, uh, our uncomfortable zone, uh, actually, most of the time as doctors, we are not accustomed to being innovative. But in research, uh, the uh, reverse happens. And actually, when we think about an idea, we need to be innovative. And being innovative doesn't only just mean to having an idea. Um, it, uh, it is a multi-step process. Apart from having the idea, we need to prove the idea. We need to analyze. And with endoscopy, of course, we are often dealing with technology because we are looking for new devices, um, new treatment methods, and how these new treatment methods can change patients' outcomes and also change our practice. And of course, teamwork is very important and only with the combination of all these different aspects that our innovation can come to, uh, can come to real. So it's really a multi-step process uh, by which we need to uh, overcome uh, different barriers. And um, in our unit, um, there are many, several elements uh, that we think uh, that uh, uh, can foster research. Um, and when you are trying to set up a uh, unit which, which is um, uh, focusing on re research, you really also need to look at your strengths and limitations. Uh, for us, we often look at the clinical question, something that we encounter every day, and uh, whether we are encountering issues in managed patients management. And if we are encountering that issue, then I'm sure all, many uh, doctors are, are, are encountering similar problems. So we look at the question, we see whether we can change clinical practices if we come up with evidence. Uh, the question uh, often, if it could cross specialty, um, then it may potentially be more impactful. And of course, we look at unmet needs as well as challenge conventional beliefs. So there are similar th uh, things like guidelines that are not supported by evidence. These are things that we often look at. And in order to have a unit that really foster research, apart from doctors, we also need to have a big research support. So we often, as a doctor, we are very busy. Uh, we do not have time to research, uh, uh, recruit cases or follow them up. So we uh, rely heavily on our research staff. So it is very important that we have research fellows or research nurses that can help us with uh, all these day-to-day um, -day, uh, formalities. And it will really help us with uh, uh, recruitment of cases. And of course, uh, environment. So in our unit, uh, similar to Nagi, um, almost all patients are recruited into some sort of trials and um, every uh, uh, investigator is um, uh, uh, very um, open to recruiting uh, patients to different studies. So we are, are quite welcome uh, to uh, performing studies. And again, funding is an area that is very important. Money is often the issue. Uh, we need money to buy devices, we need money to carry out studies, we need money to employ research staff. So um, um, to one of the elements to have a um, good research unit is of course to, to have uh, good uh, research funding. And the, these funding often come from our private uh, practices. 
So um, it is a really a balance uh, between um, getting enough funding and also uh, performing private practices to fund these uh, studies. And another thing is, apart from your colleagues, is to have a good industrial uh, support, a good friends, a lot of friends in the industry. Because um, if you have friends, if they trust the work that you do, uh, then it's really a mutual relationship. Um, you develop this mutual relationship, you help them with their novel devices, they help you with giving new devices um, to uh, perform these studies. So um, I think these are all, element, all ele these are uh, elements that we need to think about when um, a good research unit is being established. So uh, for the unit in Prince of Wales Hospital, I'm, I'm very lucky because uh, many of my predecessors actually set the scene uh, to a good research unit. Um, and for our unit, as Damien has alluded, I'm actually a surgeon. But uh, in our unit, there has been a long tradition of uh, collaboration between uh, gastroenterologists as well as uh, surgeons. So if you look at my predecessor, Professor Joseph Leung is currently um, in US. He's a gastroenterologist. So this is a old picture of Professor Sidi Jung. He's a surgeon. This is Professor uh, Joseph Sung, K.L. Chan, and this is James Lau. So Joseph Sung and K.L. Chan are gastroenterologists and Professor James Lau is a surgeon. So uh, throughout all, many, 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 many years, um, we have uh, had long tradition of collaborations between gastroenterologists and surgeons. And this really sets the scene uh, of allowing us to have open minds in terms of de developing studies that can cross different uh, subspecialties. And uh, this has in fact been our way of doing things since um, the eight, uh, eight, uh, 1980s. So this is the, a picture of one of the earliest uh, endoscopic workshops that was uh, held in our unit and it's probably one of the first uh, in the world uh, as well. So um, just looking at the history of our unit, um, we were lucky because um, um, at that time uh, we have a lot of patients with a peptic ulcer bleeding and um, Hong Kong somehow we have many many patients with uh, ulcer bleedings and this really sets a scene for us to base our research in. So uh, prior to endoscopy, um, surgery was the standard treatment of uh, bleeding peptic ulcers. Um, and uh, patients who are bleeders had to have emergency operated on to have their ulcers plicated. Uh, ob obviously surgical intervention at that time was by open surgery. So this causes significant mor morbidity. So as a result, um, this sets the scene and provides us with opportunity to develop endoscopic treatment of bleeding peptic ulcers. And this really has helped us with so many uh, huge, huge studies that has been published in so many um, in New England Journal of Medicine uh, papers. So Professor James Lau with this study compared endoscopic treatment versus surgery. Uh, this is a good study because it allows the um, comparison of treatment modalities between two uh, completely different subspecialties. One is endoscopy and one is surgery. And this is followed by many, many uh, uh, publications on uh, very huge journals um, uh, assessing different aspects of GI bleeding. So this um, really, uh, uh, with the background of the peptic ulcer disease, uh, really help us in terms of uh, achieving all these uh, publications in large journals. And as a result of all these publications, uh, certainly uh, we have got a lot of recognition both uh, locally as well as overseas. And all my predecessors, they have uh, uh, won so many awards both in China as well as overseas. Um, apart from doctors, uh, our nurses are also uh, very, very important. So this is a picture of our head nurse, Ms. Wong. Um, she is still with us, uh, but I wanted to show this picture because with our, our nursing support, which is um, the uh, bread and butter of our uh, endoscopic procedure, uh, without their support, it is uh, impossible for us to uh, do all these studies. 
um, they are not only assisting us in endoscopy, but they are also helping with uh, sometimes with recruitment as well as uh, providing all the devices that we need for uh, all these studies. And um, these are all about my predecessors. So for me, um, the idea is how to take it to this next level. So this is our current team. Professor Philip Chu is our uh, chief of um, uh, director of endoscopy and Raymond Tang and myself are both uh, deputy directors. So Raymond is a gastroenterologist, I'm a surgeon. So again, uh, upholding the traditional uh, uh, format of having uh, the unit led by uh, a multidisciplinary team. So currently, uh, our research interest is multifold. So apart from uh, treating bleeding peptic ulcers, as we know, endoscopy has really branched out significantly. So um, apart from diagnostic endoscopy, now our focus is really on all these different branches of uh, interventional endoscopy. So uh, for myself, I'm uh, focusing more on US and ERCP interventions, but um, uh, for Philip, is focusing more on submucosal endoscopy and also robotic endoscopy. Uh, we have new guns coming out. Uh, Shannon focusing on artificial intelligence, anti-reflux, bariatric endoscopy, and so on. So um, you really need to streamline all, all these different uh, sub, uh, sub areas of endoscopies. And even with uh, endoscopies, endoscopies is becoming more and more specialized. So, we try to um, categorize these different type of endoscopic treatments and try to have something under each type of uh, subcategory. So one person will be uh, responsible for each sub subcategory and um, uh, be responsible for developing re research from there on. And um, with this sort of framework, uh, we have many, many studies going on and our research nurses are very important because at any one time we have up to 50, 60, or even st seven study, 70 studies going on. And for us doctors to take care of this is hopeless. So we really need our nurses, our research nurses to be uh, taking care of the um, recruitment and also uh, following up of these uh, patients. So um, for myself, um, as you know, I focus more on uh, EOS and ERCP procedures. And I just want to um, give you a, a, a sort of uh, my uh, um, experience on developing a US guided interventions in Hong Kong as well as, as in the world. Uh, as Damien has suggested, I'm a surgeon. So um, uh, with surgeons, uh, the proscopic cholecystectomy is uh, one of the uh, bread and butter procedures. But in terms of endoscopy, endoscopic gallbladder interventions is actually an area that is a very, in the past, rarely tackled. So this is one area that I was uh, heavily uh, focused on in my research. And uh, particularly um, in the past, uh, where lab coli is the standard of uh, treating many gallbladder diseases, uh, I also want to see how endoscopic uh, gallbladder interventions can be adopted into clinical practice. So firstly, I, ident I, I ad identify my group of patients. Um, uh, in first, uh, in these groups of uh, patients that are at very high risk for cholecystectomy. So how uh, we can uh, develop endoscopic treatment to help uh, with this group of patients. And also to me, it represents a uh, logical uh, progression because uh, if you look at the development of ERCP, it really started from surgical drainage to percutaneous drainage. And then subsequently, uh, ERCP is now the standard of uh, draining the bowel ducts. So similar to the ERCP for the gallbladder in the past, we would perform an open uh, surgical cholecystostomy and where percutaneous cholecystoscopy came by, this was the drainage uh, option, uh, the, the, the optimal drainage option. And then now for me, it seems to be a logical progression to develop into the endoscopic drainage. And of course, uh, back 
uh, 10 years ago, there are many issues that we need to consider uh, when we perform years gynecology drainage. And of course, there were a lot of concerns when I first performed this, particular from uh, older generation surgeons, where we had a lot of discussions on whether we should do this on fit or high risk patients. Because uh, if we do it on fit patients, if we even if we go into issues, we can still operate on them. Whilst for high risk patients, if we go into troubles, uh, we cannot operate on them. And so there were a lot of concerns. Uh, on, also, there were a lot of technical issues that we need to overcome, particularly the gallbladder is not a non adherent organ. So if we place uh, stents, there's a risk of migration leak and new peritoneum. But then I'm very lucky uh, because uh, I have I met uh, one of the uh, very important persons in developing years guided uh, therapy. So Ken B. Moella uh, came up with the idea of developing lumen opusing stents. And actually when we met, it was like a heaven made um, um, couple because um, his idea uh, of at the axial stents is really to drain the gallbladder. And he was actually having trouble in finding a surgeon who is brave enough to do this. So when we first met each other, this was like a present given by God because uh, we immediately uh, found each other very uh, useful and we, we had a lot of um, uh, good ideas in collaboration. So um, for me, it was also a great opportunity to come by because um, it allowed uh, me to use this device into developing um, the procedure, as well as uh, uh, coming up with many studies uh, thereafter. And also at the same time, the Axios came at a time where um, there is increasing industrial interest uh, in year-specific stents. So not only the Axios, but there are other lumen opposing stents like Spexis or Nagi, and all these stents really help with the development of US guided uh, procedures, making them much more easier to perform as well as safer to perform. So this was the first case report of the hot axios. Um, this was uh, performed in one of our uh, uh, endoscopy workshops. I wanted to show this because um, this was one of the most important case reports um, that I've published because it was the first hot axios case. And I, as I've written here, this, is, this case report has been cited many times, 31 times, because um, the hot axios uh, really made a big change to, uh, to our years guided therapy. So uh, this, for this uh, case report, I think it, it is uh, very memorable for me. And in order to prove that uh, these lumen opposing stents are really helpful in uh, keeping two organs together, we performed this ex vivo study to actually measure the force generated by these lumen opposing stents. So this helps to help us to put into uh, idea how much force these stents uh, generate uh, and provides us with some basic data to support our procedures. The GALAXY trial was the first uh, multi-center cohort study uh, on U.S. gynecology range with the Axio stent, 30 patients. And thereafter, we used the same uh, study data to compare it with percutaneous drainage. This was a study performed with Pires Miranda to see how this new procedure compared to our uh, percutaneous friend. And we showed that the overall adverse events rate was significantly lower. And this study also set the scene for a performance of a randomized trial, which I was able to uh, publish later on in GUT. And with US gallbladder drainage, it also opened up a lot of uh, interesting uh, uh, procedures. So the peroral cholecystoscopy was not previously possible, but with the axios, we are able to now able to access the gallbladder and perform gallbladder interventions. So in this study, uh, we performed many gallbladder interventions like uh, MBI cholecystoscopy, even convocal or endocytoscopy. 
And we were able to show that with the axial stance, the stone clearance rate can be up to 88%. So uh, with peroral cholecystoscopy, we were able to first uh, identify uh, what it looks like in a normal gallbladder. So there are a lot of pretty projections in the gallbladder. We can perform um, fancy imaging like MBI in the gallbladder and as well as magnified endoscopy. This is a gallbladder which, where when we inserted the endoscope, we found that there are a lot of necrotic mucosa, uh, which may signify that the patient actually had suffered from a gangrenous mucosa uh, during his previous um, endoscopic, uh, previous acute cholecystitis. This is a huge stone um, that where we tried to fracture it with a BML but failed. And at the end, requiring laser lithotripsy. And this is a gallbladder, which when we inserted the endoscope, were a bit surprised because pre-op CT did not show this mass. So this was actually incidental gallbladder cancer. So this really opened up our possibilities for the endoscopist and really opened our eyes uh, in terms of how we can access the gallbladder and treat gallbladder conditions. We also performed uh, many uh, meta-analysis and, and uh, network comparisons between US percutaneous as well as uh, transpiratory gallbladder drainage. So this is the newest network meta-analysis uh, incorporating 10 studies, 1,267 patients, um, and showing that PT, GBD, and US GBD had higher, highest likelihood of technical success and clinical success. US gallbladder drain had lower risk of recurring cholecystitis, and percutaneous gallbladder drain had higher risk of reinterventions and planned admissions. So all these uh, prior studies helped me set the tone for a randomized trial, which was published in GUT, and confirming the benefits of US gallbladder drainage. So we found that with the US, we were able to reduce adverse events, 30-day reinterventions, and so on. And also, we used the same data to perform a cost-effective analysis, and we showed that the total average cost of US was still higher than percutaneous group, and the main cost was due to the cost of the send. So sending an important message to our factory uh, industrial partners that perhaps the send should be a little bit cheaper. But uh, all this uh, really helps us to help me to put into the perspective of management of acute cholecystitis. So to put EUSGBD into the perspective of management of acute cholecystitis in high-risk patients, uh, if the expertise is available, then EUS perhaps should be considered. Then the next step is to see if we can uh, use this procedure in some surgical candidates. So as a surgeon, I don't think EUS should be adopted for every single surgical patient, but maybe some patients uh, of a selection, uh, uh, fitting some selection criteria can be considered. So we performed this propensity score analysis comparing EUS versus lab coli. The sample size was small, but we were not able to find any significant difference. <coughs> And that's why we have performed these visibility study to see if US color drainage instead of lab coli could be uh, a viable uh, treatment for sexually fit patients. So we've recruited 30 patients. Um, they are currently being followed up. We plan to follow them up to three years and see if um, uh, they have, how many of them at the end would require lab coli. There are other studies that we performed trying to define the learning curve. Uh, we noted that the, uh, if you perform less than 20 prior procedures, you'd have worse outcomes. And finally, new devices. Uh, so as I mentioned, apart from all these academic uh, knowledges, you also need to work with our, our industry partners. So this is the hot spexes. So um, performing uh, one of the first procedures with the hot spexes, uh, draining the gallbladder. And the procedure is very similar to Axios, and it would be a cautery-enhanced device opening under EOS as well as 
endoscopic view, and we have published the results of our study. And one final new device, which is from MI Tech, another uh, endoscopist controlled uh, cautery and hence the opposing set. So I'll spend some time to show this video. This is the device, which uh, is a completely different design from Axios. But again, the endoscopist controls the insertion of the cautery enhanced uh, uh, lumen opposing stent. You go in with the cautery enhanced delivery system. And then this delivery system is quite special. You rotate the knob by 180 degrees. You open the distal flange with this knob. And then under US guidance, you open the flange. The flange is to be open here. Again, after opening, you pull back the stent. And then you rotate the handle 180 degrees. And then you open the, this, the uh, uh, proximal flange in the channel. So after opening the stent completely in the channel, and then you push out the stand. So um, all these uh, new devices, again, would improve the, uh, make the learning curve uh, less difficult and improve the ease of performing the procedure. So uh, I'm gonna conclude with this side. Um, I think uh, the key to success, apart from being innovative and having good support is of course, uh, you need to have your uh, goals. You need to be persistent. And uh, you need to work hard. You need to be willing to sacrifice because um, there's no replacement to hard work. And of course, you will need all your colleagues and also friends from overseas to help you in uh, performing all these studies. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. So I'm ha happy to take questions. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, that was a fantastic talk. Uh, thank you for sharing all about uh, the Chinese of Hong Kong and all your predecessors. I think uh, you've answered a lot of questions, uh, but some things have always cropped up in my mind. You know, uh, when people try to break the barriers, they sometimes hit roadblocks. And for, for you, you seem to have overcome it and you know, continue to be successful and develop the field. So for some people who have done things like notes, you know, notes I remember, used to be very popular, but it's like now taken a back seat. You know, how did you, you know, overcome those, I mean, compared to like the notes? Is it a issue about the, the technology that was available or is it, the indications weren't quite correct. So how do you help aspiring endoscopists know when they're pushing too hard or too far? You know, because some people are now moving on to the area of maybe appendectomy via a colonoscope. You know? So these are what you call uh, things which you know, come through my mind when I hear your talk. Can you give some thoughts on that? Yeah, so I think uh, when we are performing uh, innovative procedures, uh, many of us, uh, even within this panel, uh, often have to deal with this issue. So I'm sure when uh, Dr. Reddy did the first notes appendectomy, that uh, there are thoughts in his mind that uh, what happens if we go into the peritoneal cavity and we cannot close the gastric opening? Uh, or when I first mm -hmm. performed the uh, US gobbler drainage to send my grades or uh, we mis misplace it, what we can do? I think, uh, first of all, we need to uh, go step by step, uh, be clear about our uh, abilities. Um, and all of, of course, always to have the patient's uh, um, safety as uh, first concern. And then um, I think uh, the next step is to go step by step. Um, first, if you're not sure, test out with some animal uh, models first. And then when you are uh, used to it in an animal model, then we can go a bit by bit and uh, uh, in the uh, human experiment. Of, uh, of course, we need to apply proper IRB application, have yourself protected, and of course, talk to the patient and make, them, make sure they know all the risks involved. Uh, but then, of course, as a surgeon, I'm a bit more privileged because uh, uh, if I um, come into issues myself, cause a complication myself, I can certainly uh, try to uh, amend it with surgery. Uh, and as a gastroenterologist, uh, always be friends with your surgeons as well as um, radi radi uh, radiologists. Okay, fantastic answer. Um, any questions from the panelists or from the audience? 
I think uh, I agree with uh, what uh, Anthony said about friendship. I think it's very important in this multidisciplinary setups to be have good friends with the surgeon and radiologist because only then we can break barriers. Otherwise, we cannot. Okay. Um, do we have any questions from the audience, Egypt? Uh, no questions. We can speak to the other speakers. Okay. All right. So fantastic. So. Thank you very much, uh, Anthony. So uh, I'll now go on to the next speaker. And uh, it's my great honor and privilege to have Professor Dubey here, who's my mentor. You know, I spent a, a, a time with him in Belgium and I was actually very fortunate to be a fellow there. I got to see firsthand how he conducts a live endoscopy workshop. It's like a well-oiled machine. And uh, recently I attended the most recent one and you can see that it's improved over the years. It's got, it's got uh, you know, online uh, questions and answers. You have so much interaction. And I felt that despite, you know, uh, being around for so many years, uh, being one of the, the longest endoscopy workshops around the world together in Hong Kong, it's still so relevant uh, to all the young aspiring endoscopists. So I, every, every one of us hopes that one day, you know, we could also run our own workshop and you know, draw in the audiences and share all the knowledge we gain. So I thought I would like the, my mentor to be able to share with us how he's been so successful all these years and uh, he can give us this pulse of wisdom. So without much ado, uh, Professor Davia, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Damien. It's very nice to be with friends and uh, doing this session. So, of course, what I will tell you is much more personal reflection about how to create. You asked me to give tips and tricks, so it will be a personal view. The question of maintaining it will be a question which will be more prominent over the next year because the, the pandemic has a little bit changed uh, the organization. But at least there are some principles which uh, stay the same, and we will speak about live demonstration. I will not speak about the webinars which are organized by companies. So we, we want to have a, uh, to speak about a live transmission. So I will just try to advance. So what is the objective of a live demonstration? So this is not to, to demonstrate that you are the chief of the technique. Is the, the first to demonstrate the role of endoscopy management of GI disease. This is an opportunity to analyze the clinical history and the information that we have about the patient, but also about other interventional procedures. It's the opportunity to present the endoscopic approach and to justify it with a focus on adverse event and also we should always have to keep in mind how to minimize the advert event. Then only you can demonstrate the technical tricks of the procedure, and if possible, it should be associated with uh, an up-to-date about the scientific information. Uh, many people take this opportunity to, to, to review the literature and don't forget to, to, to give information to the audience about the outcomes in a given patient. So the first thing is to have a team. Uh, the team should be large enough in a single department with sufficient recruitment and expertise. So if you speak about a team like the AIG, this is never a problem, but uh, you should not start a, a live workshop if you know that you have to, to be uh, selecting the patient for six months before the live workshop to be sure that you will have it. You can also use your network uh, in order to ask to refer patients during the one or two weeks before the meeting, but patients should not be scheduled to six months ahead for the meeting. Uh, one course director, one and only one course director during the, the two, the three or the four days of the meeting. And then you can have a co-director who is in charge of clinical management of uh, gathering the information. Uh, this can be your closer co-worker or your fellows, and Damian, you, you play this role also. Uh, you should have dedicated expert nurse or assistant involved in the organization and the patient treatment, and you should have a course coordinator uh, who is more an administrative person, but who will be the main contact for partners and providers. So the team that, that's never done a meeting is never organized by one or two doctors by themselves. If they have no team, it will not be a success. So the case presentation is quite important. 
uh, when we look at the, the, the way to present, you should give the patient, the, the, the people, the information about the clinical history. It should ideally not be done into the room because then you cannot illustrate that, but it should be in a dedicated place where you give the, all the information which is needed about uh, the, the case in order to know the teaching purpose of the case before to go to the, the operator. And you see that the operator is rarely alone. He has a co-moderator. We will, we will come back on the role of the co-moderator in the room and the co-moderator in the audience. Uh, don't forget that we will have to present not only the clinical history of the patient, but we will have also to present the, the, the imaging. This is very important to gather the imaging in order to put the audience in the same context as the one you, the, the operator, will be. So they know about the, the pre-therapeutic imaging, in this case, MRI, which shows and justify in part with the clinical history, the indication of the, the treatment. So the experts are, of course, uh, uh, the key for success. They should be uh, first uh, selected for their clinical wisdom. Uh, I think that uh, I don't want to have an expert who is a, a champion of one technique and who wants to demonstrate his technique in any case. And he has to be at the level of conscious competency. This is a, a, a term that uh, Nagy very often used. You know, this is the, the, the end of the evolution of competency in endoscopy. So that means that you know, not only do you know what you do, you can do it very well, but you, have, you are able to put words on acts. And this is uh, very important then, to, to be able to explain uh, what you do. And moreover, the, the good experts are able to continue to work while they are explaining uh, what they do. Uh, those who are starting, they, they stop working while they explain. Uh, at a certain level, they can do uh, both together. They should know when to stop or to do not start. They are never there to do a demonstration of themselves, but to treat the patient. They should be comfortable with the technique. And one thing which is important is that you should never give the expert uh, the, 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 the case in which, in whom you failed, or which are extremely difficult. Uh, the, the, the purpose is to teach uh, a technique and not to put the expert in a challenge where we know that he will be in trouble. And of course, there should be a third case, a practicing routine and which can also be done in the local center with a very few exception. Uh, if you provide a case to an expert, there should be uh, people able to do similar case in your center. So the moderators are very important. Ideally, they should be moderator in the auditorium or on the web transmission and in the endoscopy room. Their role is to offer complementary explanation, to answer the question of the audience when they can, and to comment about the literature and the scientific evidence. The auditorium moderators may ask questions to the, the operator, but the endoscopy room moderator, and this is a, a, a mistake that I've seen very often, are not there to, to ask questions to the operator who is already working. They are there to protect the operator and to answer the question when they can. When they cannot, of course, the operator himself can answer the question. But the role of the moderator, if you have two people in a room, is not to have an additional person to ask questions to the operator who is already under the, the spotlights. So the location where a meeting should be performed is a clinical department with a large enough endoscopy unit. So a strict minimum are three rooms which will be equipped together for smooth transitions and which will offer the possibilities for various treatment. There must be a clear mobilization and information outside the endoscopy, of course, in the clinical boards, but in anesthesiology, radiology, admission. This is this is the teamwork 
They must be a resting area uh, for the operators, but also a resting area for the partners of the, of the industry. I see that uh, an industry representative, with very few exceptions, has no role in an endoscopy unit during live demonstration. The endoscopy unit should be strictly limited to the people who are in charge and the AV person. Uh, so that's very important because we see two of them, uh, and this uh, industry representative in the room, they can answer the question, they can be useful in the resting area to help uh, discussing the material or discussing uh, what, they, what they, they, they expect or they like, but they should never be uh, participating actively in the endoscopic procedure. And this is a very important message to give also to the audience. Of course, you need an auditorium and you need when you can do an on-site meeting, an exhibition area where the people can exchange, not only with the industry, but between themselves. And this is something that we miss with the absence of uh, the reduction of uh, on-site uh, live events. So the partners are, of course, important because they provide the financial support. But they are also important because they bring novelties. And uh, we are always very uh, happy to see uh, partners who will uh, bring us novelties. But it's, if it's really novel, I would uh, suggest, and this is at least what I do all, all the time, I never try a new device during a live meeting without having tested it before. This is true for endoscope. This is true for... Uh, device for, for medical device, we should be uh, routinely used to the manipulation of, uh, of a device or an endoscope before demonstrating it. This is also true for other endoscope, and this is for the benefit of the companies also that uh, we have the material that we are not used to available for uh, some time before the, before the procedure. I think that you should close your microphone in the barcode event. Uh, may I ask uh, the organizer? Yes, organizer, please microphone? close the mic. So the, the, the partners are very often supportive. Uh, they must be informed that their material is used and promoted when appropriate. So that means that we should never sell a procedure for a specific mm -hmm. device. And this is a very important uh, message. And there should be uh, multiple partners in order to offer a variety and to avoid obvious bias. I think that the, the, the very successful live meeting uh, uh, trying to cover all the material which is available and they are not dedicated to a, to a single sponsor. This is very, very important in offer to, to offer. So uh, I'm sorry, but may I ask the person in barcode events to close this microphone? Excuse okay. me, the yeah. uh, We have to, to understand that the relationship with the partner is an area at risk of conflict of interest. And this is why we all have to also uh, publish our disclosure. Uh, there is a very, well, there's one thing which is important and which is very, um, uh, very important point also for the cohesion of the team. A live event organized every year, every six months, every two months or every five years, it requires an overall dedication. Uh, on the clinical point of view, from the fellows to the seniors, also a multidisciplinary uh, dedication. The surgeons, the radiologists uh, must know that we are organizing that and they feel part of the meeting. And at the end of the meeting, if we make a dinner to celebrate the success, all these people who are in, associated will be invited because this is a team spirit, which is uh, a very important to maintain. And therefore, the, 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 most of the participants are looking forward for the next uh, implication in such a meeting. So we need also an administrative coordination with a sense of contacts. There is, uh, we know that many of the experts are, are, are doing that as an extra work. So this is absolutely uh, un, 
uh, an effective to write them uh, reminders which are very uh, very aggressive so they, they, they should be uh, uh, they should be considered with uh, deep respect and recognition of what they want uh, everyone should be involved in promotion so for many years I was giving uh, uh, programs to everyone to distribute in the meeting. Now this is probably more via social networks or by uh, promotion during your, pre uh, your presentation. The dedication of the AV team is also uh, very important and you should be duly trained and informed about expectation if you start. But on the other hand, if you have a good one, keep it because they will learn year after year about your need and they will know what they have to focus on, because having only one single camera in a room will not give the, 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 real, uh, the, the, the real description of what you do, so they know what they have to look at and when they have to change. We need moderators in the room to know when you change from when to change from one case to another, when to stay on the case because it's a very important clinical point which is discussed or technical point which is performed. And that's uh, usually the transmission is decided by an expert physician, but the AV team should know uh, also what to look at. So the patients, of course, uh, they should have put the patient as first point. They must be informed and agree to participate, signing an informed consent. Any offered non-reimbursed treatment should be offered and free during this uh, procedure. Uh, I think that uh, this is not a, a private party, a private medicine party, but a, a, medical, a medical demonstration. The operator should be introduced to the patient by the local expert or the physician who is responsible locally and will be in the room. And very importantly, and this is a really ethical point of view, they should not be delayed in their treatment. Uh, this is the importance of volume of case for the organizing center, especially if there is a potential impact. For example, if you have a cystic lesion, which is increasing slowly in size and finally has been decided to be treated, probably you can wait for one month before treating the patient. If you have a common bilateral stone, uh, which is symptomatic, this patient should not be delayed for participating in a meeting. And, uh, and I think that this is a very important point that we have to evaluate, uh, that we evaluate patient by patient. So an ethical perspective at the time of the, the, the pandemic, uh, the virtual meetings, they increase the number of participants. They obviously decrease the interaction, even if, less during the live demonstration, but at least outside the live demonstration, but they require the same dedication in the quality uh, that is demonstrated. This is for the virtual meetings, which are transmitted from a single center. Transmitting from multiple locations and the more difficult the overall cohesion. And, and finally, uh, those attending are, uh, have more difficulties in in becoming for a wide part of the team. One point which is important also ethically is that industry saves money with virtual meeting, especially because they do not need to have a manpower on site, but on the other hand, they, 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 they lose uh, contact uh, or direct interaction uh, with the physician. But the fact that they, they save money by change their wish, and this is very varying from one company to another, they wish in, in coming back to real life meeting. Uh, there is a risk because these virtual meetings are now much more effective uh, for moving to product dedicated webinars instead of live demonstration. Of course, the product dedicated webinars are completely biased. Uh, or, or even worse, to organizations who would sell dedicated procedures to the industry just to illustrate uh, their product. So for me, that's really an ethical issue. Uh, more than ever, I think that the financial background should be scrutinized. And I come to the end. Uh, if you want to have a live meeting, uh, at least uh, my 
my feeling is that you need enthusiasm not only for you, from you, but from all your team. You, this is a way to promote your team, but you have to promote your team to get their enthusiasm. So this is very important, and it has an impact, especially on the social and professional cohesion of the meeting. So if you have a successful meeting, try to protect it, try to maintain it, because it will uh, obviously increase the team spirit of your, of your team. And finally, it will also increase your visibility and the reputation. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, it was a pleasure to, to, to spend some minutes. Thank you, Professor De Vier. That was an excellent talk as ever. Um, I was always amazed at the, the number of uh, sessions that you run uh, in terms of the workshops, and yet each time you are still so enthusiastic. So I guess it must really come as a passion, you know, uh, from you to keep going on because uh, it's now in the 39th uh, uh, workshop. So I guess some things that uh, always uh, um, comes to my mind when you run a successful workshop is the questions that um, the moderators select um, because the audience actually can vary from uh, fellows to the world experts. And it's very nice when uh, you actually get the moderator to ask relevant questions, you know, not something very esoteric or very fine detail. So how do you prepare for that, you know, do you actually, uh, before the procedure, already think in advance what questions you think the audience may think of? Or, you, or just from experience, you know, that these are what the audience are thinking? Uh, so, uh, what, one way to do it is, uh, and you, you will see that in some, I would say, old meetings, so those who are organized for more than 20 years, or uh, more than 30 years, uh, we have uh, this uh, permanent faculty. So the permanent faculties are those with whom we are used to work for many years and they know what they should select. So I have not to tell uh, Nagi Reddy, for example, uh, which question he should select when he's a moderator. He will do the selection by himself. Uh, when we have a question uh, which is raised and which is not relevant, I think that the moderator, the, the, the expert, acting or the expert, which is a co-moderator in the room, can very politely just say that we can discuss that at, a, at another uh, occasion. And, and that's, that's close the question because the, the unuseful question, they just dilute the message and they are, they are not very useful. But again, uh, if you want to have a meeting and you want to be uh, on, the, on the safe side, try to always have one or two uh, experts, invited experts who are also friends, but more, more than ever, I have the same line of thinking and the same ethics as you have. Then when they are there, you are, you are, you are uh, a little bit more quiet, especially if you are at the time the director of the meeting, because you know that they will react in the proper way. Okay, fantastic. And one other last question. Um, as uh, you know, there's this control room behind the scenes that always uh, switches between the rooms. You know, who, who's that person there that actually does it so well? Because some meetings you find that they dwell in one room for too long and the audience starts to grow bored. For example, like a long dissection case. You know, how do you manage to juggle between that, every single room? Yeah. That, that's, that, that's a very important point. And you ask the question because you know how we work. But uh, uh, the person in charge must be a senior endoscopist. For, for, for many years, it was the chief of the clinic of endoscopy in our place who was uh, in charge of this, uh, uh, this selection of case, when to move, when to stay, in order, as you say, to avoid to stay one hour on an ESD or uh, in order to avoid to leave the, the, the case when, when the, the dissection would be finished, just two minutes before the, the dissection will be finished. So yes, not only to look at the picture, but to understand the clinical, uh, the, the, the clinical demonstration which is given, to evaluate whether it's relevant, and also to evaluate if he has time to go in another place while coming back to the procedure in order to show the result or to show the very important part of the procedure. You know, it's always the same in a demonstration. Usually you, you start speaking a little bit, you, you have a challenging part, which is at the beginning, then 
Usually, uh, there is a, a part which is maybe less interesting. Sometimes it's very interesting, but you always want to come back and to show the final results, especially if you are in trouble. On the other hand, there are also people who like to see uh, the, the, the very super expert uh, suffering during a live demonstration. That's something that you can accept. But on the other hand, also that, that this is the protection of the patient, the, the, the moderator should feel that he has to leave the, the expert alone, to leave him working quietly for the safety of the patient and come back to demonstrate something. Don't forget that during a live meeting, there is only one director. So if I, even if I, uh, I'm considered as a good expert in ESCP, and I'm working in AIG and Nagi comes and tells me, uh, no, you stop the procedure or no, I want to take over the tube. There is no discussion. There is no discussion. There is one director and the director has all the power of doing what he wants. Thank you so much for answering. Uh, any questions from the panelists or from the audience? Yeah. I have. Uh, Diamond, I think this point, uh, Jack, of course, has given a fantastic talk as usual because of experience. And I think the most important thing what he emphasizes is that this should be science behind what you're demonstrating. I mean, most of the workshops you see are just procedures that just like tricks and trade. They just show you a procedure and this. But you see in the Brussels workshop, uh, you know, of course, how they also project a lot of literature, the the science behind this, what are the latest articles on this and what is, so that I think has become a very important component that one should also all the time during the workshop keep doing so that it's education and not just the technique that's important. Thank you. Are there any questions from uh, Egypt or from the audience? Um, so, Shah, can I ask you a question? Are you finding it more and more difficult to do live demonstrations from requirements of the hospital or the university? Uh, for example, in Hong Kong nowadays, when we do a live demonstration, we are not allowed to talk to the endoscopist. So yeah, any discussion in the room needs to be in the room. So any outsiders cannot talk to the room, endoscopist in the room. Are you, are you encountering such a problems in your in your uh, we 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 always try to to avoid to have too many people uh, into the into the room we just limit to to two uh, two endoscopists in the room even if there is always somebody from our team in the room for the safety of the patient the question of registration of an insurance have been raised uh, uh, over the last uh, few years so that means that uh, we have been able to have a routine covering by insurance the, the, the doctors and now we know that we will have probably to ask a, a copy of the diploma to be sure that they will be allowed to, to be visiting doctors. But that means that uh, we consider, and this is why this is important always to have a, a one, one of the local doctors in the room, uh, we consider that they participate in the treatment, not they are, that they are the principal operator. But this, this might change, and I agree with you that uh, we have more and more hurdles for this live demonstration, especially for welcoming people from abroad. Uh, in, in, my, in my country, especially when welcoming people outside the European community. Okay, uh, thank you so much for all the questions. I think we probably have to move the last speaker uh, in the interest of time. Thank you so much, Professor Devia. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right. Bye-bye. Okay, so uh, for the last uh, speaker, it, it's my pleasure uh, to invite my uh, senior mentor, uh, Professor Christopher Koff from Singapore General Hospital. He'll be sharing with you about his experience in setting up a modern endoscopy unit. Uh, Singapore General Hospital is the biggest hospital in Singapore, and he was tasked to uh, set up a modern endoscopy unit. So he's went around the world to see how endoscopy units around the world uh, uh, create uh, what you call efficiency as well as patient privacy and uh, how to run it smoothly. So without much further ado, uh, pass it over to Professor Christopher Kong. Thank you very much, Damien. Uh, can you hear me? 
I just want to thank uh, the organizers for this uh, the this honor uh, and this opportunity to share uh, our experience in uh, Singapore General Hospital in in uh, develop in in our uh, the experience we had uh, developing our endoscopy center. Um, as as Damien has mentioned, we are the big, largest hospital in, in in our small country and uh, also the oldest, just having. Uh, turned 200 years old last year. Uh, and um, we have seen our clinical volumes rise steadily over the years. Um, and uh, this became a problem actually at, at uh, one point when we recognized that our uh, endoscopy, existing endoscopy center was really too small uh, you know, for the uh, workload that we were having to face. Uh, and so uh, we were fortunate in that we um, had the support of the uh, hospital executive uh, to, to, uh, to rebuild uh, our endoscopy center. And this we set out to do. Uh, and we opened this, our new endoscopy center uh, back in 2017. So it's been running for about four years now. Uh, and you can see from this, this chart over here, the, 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 the I, I beg your pardon? Yeah. Uh, you're, are you able uh, to show your slide? I'm, I'm actually sharing my slide now. I, I'm screen sharing right now. We can't see the slides here. I think okay, you're, yeah, we can't see the slides or something. Okay, uh, let me, I was sharing my screen just now. Uh, let me just try again. How about now? Can you see it? Okay. Sorry. No, we can, yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry. Thank, thanks for uh, just highlighting that. Okay. So um, you can see from this chart really that uh, uh, volumes are just rising and rising. And clearly we had to do something about this uh, and, and build new infrastructure. And uh, we're fortunate that the hospital uh, saw it fit to, uh, to support this and provide us with the resources to do it. Um, we, we, the, Workload distribution really was uh, roughly 80% outpatient ambulatory cases and roughly 20% inpatient cases. And so therefore in the new infrastructure, we would take care of all of the uh, outpatient and the complex uh, interventional endoscopy in the new center to be known as the ambulatory endoscopy center. And the inpatient work would just then be done at the old place, uh, which would be redeveloped uh, as well and also incorporate lung endoscopy. So if you look at this, uh, this is what we, uh, we started to work with. Uh, we had this uh, site, which is at one end of the, end of, of the hospital campus. Uh, and fortunately we, we had a, a 2000 square meter site to work with. Um, and uh, the planning committee uh, was multidisciplinary uh, and involved all the, the key stakeholders uh, which were the end, end, end users represented by endoscopists, nursing, in, infection prevention, and of course, hospital management together with the hospital infrastructure services and our architects. Um, and uh, so to, 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 I guess, work into some of the details uh, that, that were involved, let me share that with you. Uh, so this was the old uh, endoscopy uh, center. And you'll see from this spaghetti diagram that really it was uh, workflows were suboptimal, the size was too small. Uh, and uh, we clearly had to do something about this because we were bursting at the seams. And so we, we started work uh, with this vision and this mission in mind. And the vision was really to build a world-class uh, ambulatory center that delivers diagnostic and therapy endoscopy services and focuses on uh, optimal outcomes and experience for our patients. And um, the mission was to really uh, integrate, uh, enhance patient safety standards, enhance infection prevention standards to ensure best patient and staff experience. And to do that, we needed to incorporate distinct, uh, very well optimized workflows and processes and IT innovations. And also to learn something from the industrial lean principles and system thinking in facility and, and process design. So 
this is the um, site that we worked with, uh, and it was a slightly oddly shaped, but uh, we managed to, to do something with it. Uh, and I just, uh, without, uh, you know, going to too much detail, this were the, these were the, uh, the, the planning norms that we uh, made use of uh, in order to, uh, to build the infrastructure and come up with the structural plan. Uh, we needed to uh, look at and, and comply with some of the regulatory standards uh, that were not only local, but also international and organizational in uh, executing our plan. And uh, you have those listed. So there were five functional areas that we uh, worked with. Uh, and uh, you can see these laid out here from the entrance uh, registration counter where the uh, the, the, the uh, patient uh, journey begins to pre-procedure, the procedure rooms and recovery room, uh, and then finally discharge. And you'll see from this green, uh, uh, you know, uh, little uh, line here uh, that the patient's journey begins at that single entrance into the, into the center uh, registration through to uh, pre-procedure, the change, and then they wait, uh, and and, uh, and and then to be uh, to be uh, to do the medical check-in. And when, once that is done, uh, and they they are called into the procedure room, out into the uh, back in, into the discard the, the recovery area, and then to the discharge uh, lounge. Uh, and I'll show you a little bit more uh, in a bit more detail here. Uh, the, the way the the whole center was laid out. Um, what you can see is maybe we can just move into this next uh, uh, part of the, the diagram to show you that there were the, uh, the procedure rooms are here in this L shape, uh, and in the in the inside of the L is the uh, recovery area. This is the in blue here is the main procedure uh, patient corridor, uh, and in the back of the uh, rooms. Uh, this is the service corridor, which is accessible only to staff. Um, and here at the angle of the L is the reprocessing room. And we can see that the, uh, this is, uh, the way we set this up really was in order to, to enable a, a single uh, sort of direction workflow for both patients and also for uh, clean uh, supplies, including endoscopes, linens, and also, as, and again, a single uh, uh, direction for the uh, dirty uh, endoscopes and dirty uh, linens and stuff to move to, to either disposable or cleaning facilities. Uh, and over here, you can see on the long limb of the L, the, uh, we have seven uh, smaller rooms, uh, endoscopy rooms, which really are meant to take care of the bread and butter, uh, short uh, duration, high volume procedures, uh, and here, three uh, larger endoscopy rooms, including two floral uh, and enabled rooms uh, to take care, uh, to do the uh, more complex and longer lasting procedures. Uh, and again, uh, to show you this uh, one way uh, flow uh, of that patient who begins his or her journey here, uh, comes through into pre-processing, uh, gets their medical check-in done into the room uh, and out back uh, after the procedure into uh, the recovery and then out again. And the old uh, and the dirty scopes, of course, uh, I beg upon the clean scopes will come in from, from, uh, from the uh, out of the washing area into the room and then uh, after procedure back into the service corridor uh, for dirt where, where the uh, uh, dirty scopes will end up here in the single entry into the dirty area of the uh, re reprocessing room, reprocess out into the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the clean area of the, uh, end of the, the reprocessing room. I'll show you a little bit more detail uh, later. Uh, this is really uh, some of the calculations that we made use of to uh, determine the time uh, that we needed to spend, uh, uh, patients needed to spend in each area and thereby to uh, plan also the number of uh, stations, the number of rooms, the number of recovery beds uh, that would uh, suit our needs. 
And so the, the point here is that uh, we need to look at uh, uh, time motion analysis in order to work out uh, how much of each uh, station, each bed uh, that we need to plan for this, uh, any facility that you're building. So uh, reiterating that we focus on patient experience, patient safety and efficiency, and also the staff experience as well. Uh, this is how uh, we executed the, the plan. So the background again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the, the uh, uh, outpatient colonoscopy and gastroscopy accounts for the vast majority of cases. And then the more complex, longer uh, duration procedures, uh, roughly about 5%. The, uh, so looking at the, uh, uh, a, little, a little bit more detail about the, uh, the uh, uh, functional areas, the, this is where the single entrance is, uh, patients self-register, and they get a single queue number for the entire patient journey, which begins where the detailed registration occurs here. And then they go through this uh, door uh, over here, which I'm pointing out into the pre-procedure area. Um, and the, this is what it looks like when they go through that door uh, and uh, they, get a, uh, they, they get their uh, IV uh, line and their medical check-in done uh, after having changed. And when they are, uh, their number is called, uh, that single number that they hold on to, uh, and then they make their way uh, with some help from the, the, uh, the nursing staff into one of the rooms uh, that uh, they are called into for their procedure. So they walk into their procedure uh, into one of these uh, endoscopy rooms. So this is a standard endoscopy suite. Uh, we worked out that we would need a minimal uh, dimensions of four by six meters uh, in order to do uh, all the things we needed to do, including to turn the uh, patient trolley around simply because uh, about 50% of our procedures involve both uh, EGD and colonoscopy, and therefore the patient needs to be uh, swung around. Uh, a pendant setup allows us to take all the equipment off the floor and maximize the space um, and uh, to do all the monitoring and the uh, also with space for the uh, electrosurgical units the, uh, and everything else that needs to go in there. So you can see that the entrance uh, of the patient and the clean supplies is in here and the dirty supplies goes out through the back. Uh, that door here and the, uh, the uh, linens can actually go through this pass-through uh, uh, hole in the wall as well to maintain that flow. And this is what a typical uh, room uh, looks like. Uh, we wanted as far as possible to standardize every single room so that staff don't have to think too much when they go into the room uh, to, because each room is the same as the next uh, for these uh, high volume uh, endoscopy suites. So this is what it looks like uh, for some of the uh, for the three rooms in the short uh, limb where the more complex procedures are uh, done, uh, and we'll talk, we'll just show you a few more details. Uh, they are larger, of course, uh, you know, uh, with additional space for not not only anesthesia but for some of the uh, hardware that we need to bring in for the uh, more complex procedures. And of course, these rooms also have that minimum uh, three that we need uh, in order to, to, to run a live endoscopy course as well. Uh, so this is the uh, room, the large room with the uh, uh, procedures. Uh, again, could I just ask for the... Uh, can the organizer please mute? Okay, so this is the uh, just a little bit more detail for the uh, ERC, where the room where uh, Damien and I, uh, you know, spend a lot of our time, uh, and the multiple monitors and the uh, ex, ex, uh, the, the large. Uh, 
uh, and multiple devices in. Uh, just a little bit of detail of the uh, work areas, uh, functional areas for the, uh, the, the staff in that room. Uh, okay, and a typical procedure, and you can see that uh, the, the two uh, larger rooms uh, are on either side of our conference room with lead glass, so that uh, if there are additional learners, they, they, can, uh, they can look in uh, and, and uh, see what's going on without crowding the room. Uh, so here uh, we are moving on to the uh, recovery area in orange. Uh, this is what it looks like uh, from the central nursing station, which has line of sight to most of the beds there. Uh, this is a uh, little innovation that we have, which allows uh, uh, the uh, room staff to see, uh, you know, where all the uh, uh, where the empty beds are, and to assign patients into the into the uh, recovery beds before uh, they actually leave the endoscopy room. Uh, we have solid uh, screen panels for infection control, which can be wiped down after every patient. Uh, and the, the system also provides estimated time of uh, arrival into that uh, recovery bed from the endoscopy room as well. Again, uh, a few more details in the view of the recovery area. Uh, we have 36 of them total. Uh, and uh, the, our patients spend an average of about 60 to 90 minutes in, in recovery before they move out to the uh, the discharge lounge, which is pictured here, where the uh, next of kin will pick up the uh, patient and uh, patients also receive their discharge plans and uh, their endoscopy reports. Uh, the, of, of note is that the uh, recovery area is not open to the next of kin except in exceptional, exceptional circumstances. Uh, again, to support infection control uh, and also to ensure that the patients have a uh, environment uh, which is conducive to their uh, recovery. So this is the clean side of the uh, of the uh, reprocessing room. There is complete physical separation uh, between the dirty side to the left of this bank of ten uh, reprocessing uh, machines, uh, each with two uh, two uh, two uh, cleaning tubs. Uh, so we can potentially put, uh, process twenty endoscopes at one time. Uh, so this is completely clean. There, there is no way that a scope, a dirty scope, can go to the clean area without having passed the uh, an endoscopy uh, cleaning process uh, and uh, and completed it. Uh, so this is what it looks like on plan. Uh, red is dirty. Uh, a scope comes into the a dirty scope comes into the corner. Uh, manual cleaning is done here, and when that, once that is complete, it goes into the machine and out through this way. Uh, through the uh, drying, uh, drying process here. And after the drying process is, uh, is, is completed, the scope goes out into the room or it goes into the uh, drying cabinets. Uh, and again, just a view of what it looks like uh, here uh, on the clean side uh, and the, uh, the, well, the dirty side, uh, sorry, was, uh, let me see, this is still clean, clean side. This is the dirty side. Uh, over here with the manual cleaning and the drying cabinets over here. So uh, a very, you know, uh, complex process uh, as, as all of us will appreciate. Uh, and with the uh, highly automated uh, machines, we can minimize uh, the, the uh, uh, well, or, or rather uh, ensure that as many steps as possible are uh, standardized to reduce uh, the potential for failure. Uh, staff facilities really to ensure that our staff are well looked after. Uh, this, this area is large enough to accommodate uh, 50 of our staff at one time. Uh, we stagger their, their breaks. And also uh, they, so the area is also doubles as, a, uh, as an educational uh, facility as well. Uh, teaching and training, um, I, I made a short mention of the uh, small conference room that is between uh, the two, uh, two of the, 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 the uh, uh, therapeutic rooms, and we are able to transmit uh, what's in those last three rooms 
into, into the conference room and then out into a conference uh, or rather a, a large auditorium, which is in a separate educational building uh, two or three blocks away. So uh, to summarize, there's uh, uh, some of the innovations that we feel are a little bit more worthwhile in, in uh, when we put this place together, a one-way queue management system, aged and disabled friendly design, distinct clean uh, logistic and supplies flow in all areas, uh, a pendant system for equipment, silent and inf inf uh, seamless communication system, uh, customized recovery bed units, uh, integrated wireless vital systems monitoring, a pass-through pass system flow for scopes, waste, linen and supplies, uh, complete physical separation between uh, clean, uh, dirty and clean areas in endoscope re reprocessing and some enhanced uh, safety features, uh, which I would, would not be able to, to, uh, to deal with, uh, to talk to you about right now. But I thank you for your attention and I'll be happy to answer questions if you have them. Okay, thank you very much, Chris, uh, for the excellent talk. Um, and the beneficiary of it is I'm now running the center with about 36,000 cases per year and it's really, really efficient. Um, the things that the visitors always ask, you know, is like when you plan an endoscopy center, you know, you're using all these uh, Six Sigma uh, just-in-time principles, you know, how do you uh, learn all this and how do you implement it into the, uh, to this workflow? I mean, you have an like, uh, architect that works with you or some form of a business consultant that helps you to come out with these workflow diagrams and flows. So th thanks for the question, uh, Damien. And, and I think this emphasizes the importance of a multidisciplinary team. We had the benefit of, uh, you know, uh, as I mentioned right at the beginning of the talk, uh, all the key stakeholders were involved in the planning and, and really it was a very consensual decision-making process. And, uh, you know, our uh, endoscopy center, uh, center manager, Nanny, is, is, uh, is, is a real powerhouse. And uh, you would have seen her on in, in one of the uh, 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 earlier slides, uh, and and she really provided the uh, the guidance and the principles behind the uh, lean and six sigma principles that we uh, made use of in some of this planning, uh, and to to work out the again the time norms, the time motion analysis that really was very important. In, in the way we put all of this together to ensure that there were no bottlenecks and to, to make sure that this just in time uh, principle, lean principle was adhered to. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any questions from the panelists or from the audience? No, no, no questions. We would like to thank all the experts from the excellent talks and it was very informative and very beneficial to us. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you everyone for your time. Uh, hope to see you again in person. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Okay. 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 Okay.